great leaders have through life done something before the doing. That is, they're not thinking about so much, am I doing this right, am I doing that right? The thing they first focus on is what's going on inside. They're focusing on how they're being is, is how I look at it. So leadership then for me is, first we've got to focus on here. Yeah. First we've got to focus on here. And once we've focused on this place for ourselves and we understand what puts us in the best possible place to do the best doing, to have the best impact upon the people around us, well then we get this first and then almost naturally we achieve those things. Naturally, using our own style, our own preferences, our own skills and strengths, we begin to do the things that are gonna have the best impact on the people around us. Things on leadership. And Lao Tzu, two and a half thousand years ago, said there were four levels of leadership. First level, at the bottom, was the tyrant who the people despised. We don't wanna be that. The second level was the leader who ruled by fear. Ruled by putting fear in people's minds, you know, the big stick, again, no loyalty, no loyalty, closing down the resources of the people, whoever that leader was, he or she had worked with. The third level was the leader who just loved the reflection of glory from the people, loved the praise, loved to know they were doing well. That's certainly much better. But the fourth leader and the ultimate level of leader was the leader who he didn't even know was there. The leader who was so in the background and so great at just helping people be their best and then getting out of the way, that people when they would have successes, teams when they have successes say things like, wow, can you believe we got there? Isn't it great the work we've done? Now that philosophy, 2,500 years old, is still true today. That's the transformational leader that you can be and that I'd like to help you get there. And is, is it still valid today, that point? Well, of course it is. Jim Collins wrote a book, a great leadership book, a seminal text called Good to Great. If you haven't ever read it, I recommend you go and read it. But Good to Great, uh, in that book, Jim Collins, they did a study. He was a university professor, got a whole bunch of his students. And what they studied was, um, companies which had consistently, over a period of 10 years, performed three times above all their competitors, three times above their competitors for 10 years. So that is consistent, great performance. And what they found was invariably the leader was what they called a level five leader. Level five leader. That's only had four, but they called a level five leader. And there were two things they noticed about that level five leader, which really summed up the way they dealt with people. And that was, they said when they had successes, they would look out the window. So they'd have a success. It was like they went to a balcony and somebody would be praising them with success and they'd look out the window and say, say, don't thank me. Look at all these fantastic people. They're the ones who did the work. And the flip side of the equation was when things went badly, they came away from the window. They didn't go, oh, it was all your fault. They came away from the window and they came back and they looked in essentially the mirror or a rear vision mirror, you could almost say. And looked in the rear vision mirror and said, what, did, what could I have done better? What did I do? How could I have done things differently to overcome that problem, to make sure it didn't happen? Now that's the leader who is transformational. Now you might say, well, Andrew, it sounds a bit wishy-washy. We well, you know what this is about. This is the essence of of great leadership and it's been proven. So some studies that they're constantly doing in the last 10 years, you probably heard the term employee engagement comes up and what's that about that? Employee engagement is a measure of how enthused people are to come to work. Do they really love it? Do they enjoy it? Are they excited about it? Do they feel they can give their best? A whole range of questions. And what they discovered is somebody who is really engaged intellectually and emotionally with their work, their work environment, give fantastic performance. A lot more than the average employee. You know, what do they say is the average employee goes to work, puts in about 70% of available effort 
And that's all that's required to fulfill job satisfaction, job requirements, job criteria. The star performer, on the other hand, is able to, or not able, just does, everyone's able to, get, but they do go in and they give that extra 20, 25, 30%, and they get fantastic results. Now what they've done is they've studied organisations globally that have high staff engagement, and they've compared those, that, so the top 50%, and they've compared them with the, the organisations with low staff engagement. You know what they found is? High staff engagement as, a per, as opposed to low staff engagement. Those organisations have how much increase in productivity, you reckon? It's upwards of 70% higher productivity. That's a big number. Big number. And of course, there's a washover to profitability. What's the increase in profitability? It's about, and this is the Asia Pacific average, about 40% on average higher profitability. So just by getting people more enthused, more engaged with your business, happy to be there, you can have 40% more profit. That's probably something worthwhile doing. Probably something worthwhile doing. Now, of course, you still need systems and processes, no doubt about that, but you can have all the systems and processes in the world. And if you don't have people who are really passionate about your business, don't really want to be there, not really engaged and giving their best, you're denying yourself, you know, on average, 40% of the profit you could be getting. So the Transformational Leadership Program, what does it do then? What does it focus on? It focuses on, firstly, I've already said it, haven't I? Firstly, it focuses on, it focuses on being. And after we focus on the being, then what we look at, is some of the doing. And that just makes sense. You can never have your best doing without looking after the being first. It's so true. And you know what we often see in, in you know, what I often see in organisations is there's so much focus on the doing. You know, another standard operating procedure, another manual, another checklist. But you know what? If you've got people who are, who are using those checklists, who are using those standard operating procedures who don't want to be there, who aren't invested in the business, who don't feel that they can give their best, who don't feel that there's opportunity, who don't know their leader, and don't know whether that leader has got their best interests at heart, have you guess what? The doing's never great. Not only are the standard oper operating procedures often you know, applied poorly or haphazardly, sometimes they're totally ignored. It's a sort of a rebellious sort of statement got to look after the being first and then the doing to a large degree will look after itself. So the Transformation Leadership Program, the first day of what it does is we're going to work on you as a leader. Discovering what it is about you or the things within you as a leader which make you great that are going to give you that impact on people around you, that are going to give you that leverage point, that are going to give you those points of access for the way you connect with people. And it's gonna be unique to you. There's no one style in leadership that fits everywhere. You know, we only need to look around in the world and notice that, you know what? The range of leaders is profound. It's huge. There's no one right way. And I'm certainly gonna say that my way is the right way. What I'm gonna encourage you to do though is find your way and provide you with a bit of a roadmap to get. The second day we're going to go on and talk about accountability because, you know, accountability is a great tool for leaders and all high performance employees expect accountability. If you're letting people get away with it, it's probably killing morale. Not probably, almost certainly is. It's telling your high performance employees that, you know what, um, don't bother, don't worry, why work hard here? You don't get rewarded for it. And what you're actually doing is you are reducing the value of their performance, at least in their eyes. So you must have accountability. But of course, we need to look after the way of being. So there's a way of doing accountability rather than to see it as the big stick, but make it your number one trust building and relationship building tool in the belt, in the leadership belt. And there's a way and there's a process and there's ways of being that will help you get there, I promise. 
And that's my second day. So I'm going to spend a day on doing that, doing having conversations, um, using our visualization, using our imaginations to change the way we think about these conversations, so that we approach them with a smile on our faces, with you know a bit of a step, a bit of excitement, as opposed to, to approaching those conversations with you know dread and fear, which of course we know what that does. If we don't look after the beam, what sort of doing do we get? And you know, I know this to be the case because I didn't always look after my own way of being. <laughs> and I had some of these conversations which I look back now and, you know, slightly embarrassing. But that was a great learning for me. And now those difficult conversations I have, I love them. I love them. I still get asked by clients sometimes to go in and have them with people. Because if you do them the right way, they're liberating and they're empowering for everyone involved. And you know what, as an, ex as an executive coach, which is something else I do, but really digging deep with people, I have those difficult conversations all the time. And I see time and time again, once you have them, and you know how to approach them, that when people leave, there's a weight off their shoulders. There's an opportunity, there's an opening that maybe for the first time ever in their life they can see. Now, if you can be a leader who does that, People will seek you out. And the final day, what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about teams. And how, having been on your own journey, how do you bring your team on that journey? What do you need to do to help them to step into that place? And again, there's a way of being, there's a place that you need to hold within a team. You know, you need to be the, the one that creates the space for people to feel safe enough to come together and start identifying as a group. And that means the group's got to know where they're going. They've got to know what they stand for. They've got to know that it's okay for them to say, this is who we are, this is what we expect of each other, and we're going to hold everyone to account, including you, including the leader. And they need to know and you need to find a place where there's conflict. And where they can have open conflict, but in a framework, in a framework that that conflict is almost the soil. It's like the cultivation of the soil. You know, you see a farmer plough his field. If you've ever seen, and you know, I was a farmer. Dad was a farmer. I did a lot of ploughing when I was a kid, and in my early early twenties. And when you're ploughing, you see it's actually quite a violent process. There's rocks being blown out of the way. There's you know you're churning up there. There's occasionally a bit of a tree root getting cut up. So there's a real tilling of a soil that can be reasonably uncomfortable. But if you're using that as really the foundation or the fertilizer or the cultivation process from which to bring people together, to get ideas out, to get people on the same journey, then that's incredibly healthy. And it's the job of the leader to create that space. To create a story that everyone can, can believe in, that everyone can feel part of, that has meaning. You know, and the meaning of we need to make more profit, it's not very inspiring, let's be honest. You know? We're all here to make more money for the, for the organisation. We're all here to get our next paycheck. All the sociological studies show that, you know what? Very poor motivator. And if that's the key motivator in, in an organisation, that's a key incentive, what you often find is, what do people constantly do? Put their hand out. Oh, can I have more money then? Can I have more money then? I know my pay review was only uh, three months ago, but really, I think, you know, looking around, I think I deserve more money. And then, you know, they feel better for a few months. No doubt about that. Maybe a few months is a little bit exaggerated. It's a little bit of an exaggeration. Maybe a month. And then they come back to... I'm not feeling happy again. I'm not feeling, this doesn't mean anything to me. I don't feel, I don't feel, you know, I don't feel great in here. Hmm. Well, it must be this job. It's a terrible job. Look at all these people around me. It's the boss, it's the this, it's the that. Jeez, they're not paying me enough. Man, I have more money. So day three is about getting a team on a journey so that they find their own motivation.